Hello, everybody. I missed you guys. I am so happy to be back and to have you guys here. Today, we're going to talk about the opening statements in the Alec Baldwin trial. And we're going to start noticing the body language of everybody involved. A lot going on already in this trial. Uh, I'm going to share the screen here so that we can start noticing. Uh, the defendant is the first person that I started noticing. Now, Something about Alec in this trial. First of all, let me take a step back, right? Uh, Alec Baldwin is under trial for an involuntary men's slaughter charge. This is a very serious charge. Someone has lost their life and somebody else was injured due to something that happened, right? We all know there was a accidental shooting during the film of a Rust that was going to be a movie that Alec Baldwin was an actor and also a director, I believe, or producer in the movie. We're going to find out during the trial. So the gun is supposed to be a prop gun. There is not supposed to be any live rounds ever in a movie set. Somehow a live bullet comes in and he has the gun. He doesn't know it's a live bullet. The gun goes off or he shoots the gun and someone loses their life. So the trial is going to be about uh, what are the responsibilities of Alec as an actor, as a director, as a producer, uh, and also what were the expectations from him dealing with that prop gun? Should he deal with the prop gun the same way as someone is expected to deal with a real gun, right? We're never supposed to point the gun at anybody, never hold our finger on the trigger unless you are absolutely prepared to shoot someone. So with Alec, um, with all that in mind, right, this is a very stressful situation. And with Alec, what I perceive already is that he seems to be someone who likes to be in control, right? And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I'm just saying his body language is he's very involved he is taking notes during the trial. He's talking to his attorneys constantly, and he does seem to be very stressed. Now, I was listening to Ben Shu, the attorney that represented represented Johnny Depp when uh, when he went to trial, and Ben was saying that as an attorney, something that he would remind Alec is to be human to be himself if he does feel sorrow to not hide any tears because the person who who passed away was someone who Alec deeply cared about they were friends they were colleagues in the movie industry and this is not something that he meant to do so as the jury as someone who is just a stranger looking at a big star like Alec Baldwin uh I think the jury would like to see some type of uh, remorse, some type of uh, reverence to the situation as opposed to the whole I'm in control type of thing, which I'm not uh, faulting him for this, okay? Because in a situation where you are uh, facing a trial, you are under so much pressure, people are talking about you, people are talking about the evidence. For you, I would probably be doing something like him wanting to write things down wanting to to be distracted with the facts so i don't have to go through all of what's going on and how serious this is and how freaked out i would be in that position but uh, i don't know how it looks so let's take a look at him and uh see if you guys can already see you know the amount of stress in his face uh, his eyebrows are raised uh, which is a, a signal of worry uh, he does not look uh, pleased at all. You have all the people behind him. And we are going to show, I'm going to point out to you guys when I see somebody with an expression that I believe it would be more appropriate, uh, but I'm not here to judge what's appropriate or not. I'm just pointing out, okay? So right now there's nothing going on. They're waiting on the judge and they're just, you know, small talk with the attorneys. So now he, he does have a little bit more of a... Um, you know, a light-hearted face. He did have a smile with his attorneys. They are waiting for the judge. This has not started yet. Uh, and I think I'm going to fast forward just a little bit to see when we start. Now, look at this difference already, right? As we are about to start this, 
uh, Alec has his mouth covering, I'm sorry, his uh, hand covering his mouth, which is a sign of no, don't speak. Whenever we block our eyes, our ears, or our mouth, it's kind of a, a signal in the body language world as don't speak, don't hear, don't see, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, right? So he's trying to hold back inside of him the things that he wants to say or feel uh, in an unconscious way, okay? This is a subconscious way. He's really not going to say anything. He's really not in danger of saying anything. He's just holding back his words in a body language way. So let's see um, what else. And it's also a pacifying behavior, right? Pacifying behavior when we touch our faces, when we do anything unnatural, because as I always say here, in a trial situation, you really can't get out. You are there, you're sitting there, you have to be sitting there, you have to hear all these things. So one thing the brain tries to do is find a way to pacify our stress, our emotions. And that's something that Alex is trying to do to like, you know, hold his face and just like, Caress his chin a little bit, which is a manner of pacifying behavior. Uh, let me see. Now he's just talking to his attorneys. And let's fast forward a little bit more. Uh, this is when the jury is entering or the jury or the judge. And then let's see. So it's absolutely a very different situation. Nothing that he's used to, right? He's used to, he does have a little bit of a one side of the mouth raised, which is a signal of contempt. Uh, I think that when he does that, he is directing that towards the prosecution for many reasons, which we will see during this trial. Uh, the prosecution has a very condescending tone of, uh, Carrie, especially right. The matter I'm Let's calling see. is D101CR 2024 13. I'm going to make this a little bit Kobe faster. Alexander Ray Baldwin. 1.25. All right, jury. What are you doing? What, what are you doing? doing? <laughs> so I have already sworn you in. All right, Four judge. Yesterday. Okay. And now I'm going to explain some trial procedure. All right, Judge. First What's all, going on? I want you to know this trial is being filmed, but you are not being filmed. I'm going to pause you. here. So you can see here behind Alec, you know, you got his family. I believe this is his brother and his wife, right? His wife has a very serious uh, facial expression, which is very appropriate. His brother has a very appropriate expression, in my opinion, right? He is looking extremely serious and concerned. Like, this is a serious matter. It's not, you know, we are taking it seriously. We're here to support our family. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people, they are common people like us. You know, we're common people. We're not big stars. We don't have all that kind of money. We look at, at people that, that have a different status sometimes in a way like, oh, look at her. She's so conceited. You know, we talked a little bit about that during the Carrie trial, how some women sometimes may be looking at the defendant in a different light. Uh, so, you know, if I was the family, I would watch for that as well. You don't want to seem above anybody. You don't want to seem like you're above anything that's going on. You got to you want to be very respectful to the whole process. And I think that his brother is showing a great facial expression here. Like, you know, this is serious. Not We're concerned, not only Love for it. my brother, but this is serious for the whole situation, the victim involved as well. And here you got Alec, you know, with a little bit of a lip compression. When we are stressed, we make our lips disappear. Within so. the courtroom, okay? All right. So Let's I'm keep going, going to... Um, this is a criminal case, as you know. I'm going to reread the grand jury indictment. It's um, it's very formal. So quickly, when she that. says this is a criminal case, you know, his eyes uh, get bigger. He looks at her, one eyebrow raises, and, you know, he's just being very attentive. Of course, a very, very normal, uh, very appropriate. Count one, involuntary manslaughter, negligent use of a firearm, in that honor about October 21, 2021, in Santa Fe County, New Mexico, state of New Mexico at Bonanza Creek Ranch located at 545 Bonanza Creek Road 
Santa Fe NM 87508. The above named defendant did cause the death of Helena Hutchins in the commission of negligent use of a firearm. Uh -oh. Count two in the count one in the alternative involuntary manslaughter without due caution or circumspection in that on or about October 21, 2021 in Santa Fe County, state of New Mexico at Bonanza Creek Ranch located at 545 Bonanza Creek Road, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 87507. The above named defendant did cause the death of Helena Hutchins by an act committed with the total disregard or indifference for the safety of others. And the act was such that an ordinary person would anticipate that death might occur under the circumstances. Again, Mr. Baldwin is presumed innocent. The burden is always on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. What I say now is the introduction of uh, the case and the instructions. All right. Along with the, those instructions previously given, these are preliminary only and may be changed during or at the end of trial. First of all, all of you must pay close attention to the evidence. After you've heard all of the evidence in the case, I will read the final instructions of law to you. You will also receive a written copy of the instructions. You must follow the final instructions in deciding this case. And just so you know, there's going to be no transcript available to you. Juries have asked me that, so I'm telling you up front, okay? Again, the trial is expected to last. And that's a good thing that the judge is letting them know up front because that affects how many notes you're going to take. It affects what you're going to do with the notes. If you're going to be, you know, trying to remember specific things, because in the Carrie trial, I don't believe the judge told them you're not going to be able to have your notes. To eight days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of next week. That's the trial that does not include your deliberation time. The usual hours of trial will be from 8.30 to 5, typically, uh, with a half hour for lunch. No, an hour for lunch. And then um, a morning break and an afternoon break. Again, please report to the jury lounge no later than 8.30, unless uh, we're instructing you otherwise for different reasons. But in your mind, you can always expect 8.30 to be here, okay? Do not come into the courtroom unless you are accompanied by my bailiff, Steve, okay? You may take water into the courtroom with you, and you can also take um, coffee or tea or uh, uh, um, if you have a lid on your um, cup, okay? We stand up out of respect for you because you are the ultimate decision makers as to the facts in this particular case. So when you come into the courtroom, you can go ahead and be seated, and then we will take our seats. And again, it's important to hear. So please raise your hand at any time you can't hear. Don't be self-conscious about it. Don't wait until a couple of questions have been asked. You've got to, if you can't hear, you've got to shoot that hand up right away, okay? All right, this is a public proceeding, so people may go in and out. You may find yourself looking at who goes in and out, but after a while, you'll get used to it. But if there is anything that is distracting you from being able to listen and be involved in this case, please tell Steve immediately. He'll let me know, and I'll do my best to get rid of the distraction. As you know, the temperature we cannot control. All right, so sorry, we'll try to get the county in here if it um, plummets too high. I doubt it'll plummet too low. You are allowed but not required to take notes during trial. Uh, Steve has given you a, a pad uh, a pad. And a pad uh, Pen? Okay. Uh, please put your name on the front page of your pad and then take notes beginning on the second page. On breaks, uh, follow Steve's instruction on whether to take the uh, pad with you or whether to leave it on, on your chair. You don't have to worry about confidentiality. They'll be locked up at night and, um, and when the trial is finished, they'll be shredded. Okay. Uh, don't let your notes take the place of your independent memory of the evidence. When taking notes, please do not forget to pay close attention to the trial. Listening and watching witnesses during their testimony will help you assess their appearance, behavior, memory, and whatever else bears on their credibility. Let's go through the order of trial for those that have uh, uh, not engaged in a criminal trial before. A criminal trial generally begins with the lawyers telling you what they expect the evidence to show. These statements and the statements made by the lawyers during the course of the trial can be of considerable assistance to you in understanding the evidence as it is presented at trial. Is there something distracting you, Juror? No. I'm talking to the other one. Okay. Statements of the lawyers, however, are not themselves evidence. The evidence will be the testimony of the witnesses, exhibits, and any facts agreed to by the parties. After you have heard all of the evidence, I will give you final instructions on the law. The lawyers will argue the case, and then you will retire to the jury room to arrive at a verdict. It is my duty to decide what evidence you may consider. Your job is to find and determine the facts in this case, which you must do solely upon the evidence received here in court. It is the duty of a lawyer to object to questions, testimony, or exhibits the lawyer believes may not be proper, and you must not hold such objection against the objecting party. 
I will sustain objections if the question or evidence sought is improper for you to consider. If I sustain an objection to evidence, you must not consider such evidence, nor may you consider any evidence I have told you to disregard. By itself, a question is not evidence. You must not speculate about what would be the answer to a question that I rule cannot be answered. It is for you to decide whether the witnesses know what they are talking about and whether they are being truthful. You may give the testimony of any witness whatever weight you believe it merits. You may take into account, among other things, the witness's ability and opportunities to observe, memory, manner, or any bias or prejudice that the witness may have, and the reasonableness of the testimony considered in light of all of the evidence of the case. No ruling, gesture, or comment I make during the course of the trial should influence your decision in this case. At times, I may ask questions of witnesses. If I do, such questions do not in any way indicate my opinion about the facts or indicate the weight I feel you should give to the testimony of the witnesses. Questions by jurors. Ordinarily, the attorneys will develop all pertinent evidence. It is the exception rather than the rule that an individual juror will have an unanswered question after all of the evidence is presented. However, if you feel an important question has not been asked or answered, write it down on a piece of your notepad. I'm going to stop here real quick. And this is Carrie, the prosecutor, the blonde one, right? Her face is a whole thing, like it's a whole movie. We're probably going to spend a lot of time doing body language on her. She has a resting, you know what, face, right? And look at her. She's already looking like, like this, like, like it, it, it looks like her face is saying something, right? And to me, it looks like her face is saying, this judge, like, what? I'm not saying, of course, she's not saying that, but that's what it looks like. She said her face is like, what the hell is this judge talking about? Like she, like her face is always so, uh, it's just so like annoyed and condescending. I think not annoyed, but condescending is a better term for it. And we're going to see a lot of her and she's going to be very irritating. And Alec Baldwin is going to get very affected by it. So we're going to have a lot of body language to, to notice in this uh, little, just the beginning, just day one. Paper and give it to Steve before the, her witness, face. Before, this is important, like, before the witness leaves the stand. Okay. What is I she will decide talking whether about? Your question will be asked. <laughs> Rules of evidence or other considerations apply to questions you submit and may prevent the question from being asked. If the question is not asked, please do not give it any further consideration. So the judge is going to allow the jury to ask please questions. Please do not hold it against either side that you did not get an answer. That doesn't necessarily mean that the she's going to ask jurors. every question. Again, very important. You must decide the case solely upon the evidence received here in court. Okay, I think you I'm going to go ahead and skip to the beginning, to the opening statement. Uh, let me see here. Just take a look at Alec one more time. And here we go. Got another good face here for Alec. <laughs> Poor Alec. You know, you got one eyebrow raised. You got a little bit of contempt with one side of the mouth again. And you got a little bit of chewing, stress, anxiety. You have his brother in the back doing the pursed lips, which is a sign of disagreements, right? His brother, I believe, is also an actor. And it does... It is very fitting for him to have a facial expression that shows disagreements because it, mu it must suck for them, right? They must be thinking this situation could have happened to anybody in our field. We are actors. How could he have known? And this is just something I disagree with, this whole situation. You have his wife continuing very serious, very proper po posture for her. I do... Uh, understand that she has some type of fiery personality because you have seen a few videos from her in the past, but it doesn't matter. None of this is going to come in the trial. All, we're only going to focus what's to to focus on what is in the trial. And in this case, her position, the family, everything that they're doing is going to be noticed by the jury, by the attorneys, by other people, by us. So uh, when you are someone as famous as Alec Baldwin, not only you have the trial that you're going through, the trial court proceedings, you also have the public, the opinion of the public, the perception of the public, wanting to or not, right? So it is important that his family is there to support him, and it is important that they show this type of seriousness, I believe, and reverence to the trial 
which is uh, going over someone's life that was lost. And whenever Alec is showing this type of face, in my opinion, so far that I have seen is contempt, probably for the prosecution doing something. In or out of the courtroom. Um, if you meet in the hallways or elevators, there's nothing wrong with saying a good morning or a good afternoon, but your conversation should end there. If the attorneys, parties, and witnesses do not greet you outside of court or avoid riding in the same elevator with you, they are not being rude. They are just carefully observing this rule. Oh, man. It just, it's it must be very difficult for someone who has been used to being in a position of power for so long. And I don't mean power just because he's an actor, but like, because, you know, he's a producer, so he does have to tell people what to do. He is uh, like a leader of what he is acting and, and doing things like that in the movie industry. And for him to just sit there and be like, okay, I got to listen to everything. I got to listen to all the instructions, uh, you know, pacifying behavior. Again, touching the face, resting the face like this, resting the face, doing something with your hands to pacify the stress, the nervousness that your brain is undergoing. Let me see if now I can finally right, find so the open. Okay, we're going to go straight to the, the opening case. statements. Then and opening statements. The state begins first. Two minutes, one minute. There you go. When someone plays make believe with a real gun in a real life workplace, and while playing make believe with that gun violates the cardinal oh, rules the sound got of better. Thank safety, God. people's lives are in danger and someone could be killed. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what this case is about. It's simple, straightforward. The evidence will show that someone who played make-believe with a real gun and violated the cardinal rules of firearm safety is the defendant, Alexander Baldwin. You will hear over the course of the next few days that in the fall of 2021, a movie called Rust began filming at the Bonanza Creek Ranch just south of Santa Fe in Santa Fe County. You will learn that this movie was a Western with a lot of gun action. And while it was a movie set, it was a real life workplace for many people. But you will hear this workplace- The sound just keeps changing. It's not me, it's the court. And you will learn that some of the people who were hired to work at this workplace were very inexperienced. And one of those was the armorer, a very young woman named Hannah Gutierrez Reed. You will hear testimony from crew members who worked on the set, who will tell you that to them, Ms. Gutierrez's inexperience was obvious. You will also learn that this workplace has some talented people. And one of those was the director of photography, a vibrant 42 year old rising star named Helena Hutchins. You will also learn that the director of this film was Joel Souza, another talented individual who cares deeply for his projects. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that like in many workplaces, there are people who act in a reckless manner and place other individuals in danger and act without due regard for the safety of others. That, you will hear, was the defendant, Alexander Ball the lead actor on this film. Okay, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take a quick pause here real filming. quick. Um, this is a big, you know, this is a big part of the, the opening statement because this is a very serious accusation. It's very direct accusation. That was him, Alexander Baldwin, right there. As you can see, Alexander Baldwin is completely turned away from the prosecutor. He's like, whatever. I'm just completely body blocking her, not giving her the time of the day, no eye contact, no looking at her. He's simply taking all his frustration and anger out of that piece of paper. And his brother, though, behind him does show some anger here. Uh, look at his face. I'm going to make myself a little bit smaller. And you can see his brother's face. And his brother is like, you know, frown with both uh both sides of the the lips are down you have him with um nose flare you know you can see his nose uh the sides of his nose of his nose nostrils are flaring a little bit even the wife also is showing a little bit of nose flare here 
So both of them are giving me signs of anger. Uh, you can just cross-reference both of the expressions from the wife and the brother here with uh, this woman. I don't know. Maybe she's his mother. I don't know. I don't know who that is. But her face is more serious, but still calm. And the other people too, uh, they're sitting there. But the wife and the brother, you can clearly see the sign of anger in their faces. And they're angry because she's talking about this accusation right now, which is a very serious accusation, right? And they're angry for that specific accusation. So let's keep going. On or about October 6, 2021. But the defendant did not arrive on set to begin working until about October 13th. And you will learn that prior to arriving on the set to work, he requested to be assigned the biggest gun available. So he was assigned this revolver, a replica of an 1873 single action revolver manufactured by Pieta Firearms in Italy. You will hear from Alessandro Pieta, who will tell you he manufactured this gun. And he will tell you he manufactured it in 2015. And he will explain the quality control measures that Pieta Firearms follows in order to ensure that firearms that are manufactured by Pieta Firearms don't have any problems or issues. Mr. Pieta will tell you that this firearm he himself manufactured and that when Pieta sent it to EMF, which is the company that distributes firearms for Pieta Firearms in the United States, this gun was in perfect working condition. You will hear from Justin Neal, who is a representative of EMS, EMF, excuse me, a company out of California that has historically been known to provide firearms to the movie industry. Mr. Neal will tell you that when EMF received this firearm in 2017, it was in perfect working order. And in fact, when EMF had this firearm, it was subjected to numerous quality control inspections because it was used as a show gun at gun shows. The evidence will show that in September of 2021, an individual by the name of Seth Kenny was contacted by the folks with Russ Production. They asked Mr. Kenny if he, was, he would be able to provide some firearms for the filming, for use during the filming of Rust. You will learn that- I forgot I muted myself. And then you just see the Alex attorney, right, behind her, just looking at the jury, just absorbing the jury's reactions right here. This would be great if we could see the jury's reactions, but we can't. He's just paying attention to what she's saying and what the jury is uh, absorbing. Now, she has a very good demeanor, right? She seems like a nice lady. She's just doing very, uh, uh, very thorough opening statement, very clear opening statement. She's explaining what the issue is, what the responsibilities are, and why is it that he is specifically being charged for this. So she is very easygoing. There's nothing irritating about her, annoying about her. So always good signs, right? Whenever we deal with people, uh, we have to understand that people do have a psychology. There's a lot of psychology involved and you want people to like you when they are, when you're trying to convey a message to them, especially as an attorney conveying an opening statement, you want the jury to be receptive to what you're saying. And she's doing a great job at that. So let's keep going with her opening statement. That Mr. Kenny owns PDQ firearm and prop. Chicken? It's a oh, licensed firearm and prop. dealership. Mr. Kenny and he is writing a book right now, right? He's just like putting his, he's like, Durr. and in Durr. September or on September 29th, 2021, Mr. Kenny, maybe he's just playing that game with her book. that, you know, you drop, I forget what it's called in English, but you draw a little toy and then you just go and you like kill the, the, the I don't know what the name is. I'm going to find out, but maybe that's what he's doing there with his, with his pen because he's, he's writing aggressively in that paper. And he does everything except to look at her. And you will hear that Mr. Kenny received it from EMF and it was in perfect working order. The only thing that Mr. Kenny did to this gun was to insert the firing pin. Because since it was a show gun, it didn't have a firing pin. But you'll learn that that's a very easy step. All he had to do was just insert the pin and that's it. And then Mr. Kenny had the firearms, this one and some other firearms, transfer to the set of rust at the Bonanza Creek Ranch. And on October 13th, 
2021, the defendant was supposed to have a training session with this gun and this young armor. But you will see that during this training session, the defendant had somebody or a couple of people filming him while he's running around shooting this gun. You will learn, ladies and gentlemen, or you'll hear during this trial, the use of the words prop gun. And you'll learn a prop gun is this real gun. It's not a toy. It's not made of rubber. It's a real gun. You will also see evidence, ladies and gentlemen, that during the days before that fateful October 21st day, the defendant handled this firearm multiple occasions. You will see video footage of the defendant firing this firearm, working perfectly fine. But you'll see evidence, ladies and gentlemen, that each time the defendant handled this firearm, he did not do a safety check with that inexperienced armorer. And you'll hear that the reason he didn't do a safety check is because he didn't want to offend her. The evidence you will see will paint a real life picture of a real life workplace where this defendant mishandled this gun. You will see him using this and gun he still as a doesn't look at her. to point at people, to point at things. You will see him cock the hammer when he's not supposed to cock the hammer. You will see him put his finger on the trigger when his finger's not supposed to be on the trigger. And the attorney just looks at the jury. His attorney's just looking at the jury. A firearm safety with this defendant studying this use of his reactions. Firearm. And the evidence will show that on the morning of October 21st, 2021, the camera crew walked off set. And you will learn that one of the reasons that camera crew walked out is because they were concerned over safety breaches with the use of firearms. That's crazy, right? The evidence will show that the morning of October 21st started out a couple of hours behind. They filmed some scenes at this church on the Bonanza Creek Ranch. And you will see that one of those scenes required the defendant to pull out his gun. This was in the morning, pull out his gun. And you'll hear the director tell him, pull it out and hold it. And the first time you'll see evidence, the defendant does what the director tells him. But you're, you will hear the director tell you that many times the defendant would do his own thing. So then the director in the morning asked him, okay, do it again, just like you did now. The defendant pulls out the gun, but this time he cocks the hammer. The evidence will show they then broke for lunch. And around 1.30 or so, they came back to this church to do what's called a blocking. The evidence will show that Ms. Hutchins wanted to do a blocking for an insert. And you will learn what a blocking is, just working out the details of the moves of the actor. It wasn't even a rehearsal. You will hear from one of the witnesses who walked into the church and saw the defendant kind of playing with his gun. And then you will see evidence or hear evidence that Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza were talking to the defendant about doing this insert. And the insert was just supposed to be from here to here. And it was supposed to be of the defendant just slowly taking his gun out of this holster, out of his holster, and just holding it at an angle. The evidence will show that someone asked the armorer to bring the defendant's gun to him. And she did. She brought it into the church, showed it to David Halls, who you will learn is was the first assistant director. The gun was empty. Ms. Gutierrez then handed the gun to the defendant. But then you will hear that Ms. Gutierrez was given the gun back and she took it and loaded it with dummy rounds. And what you will learn is that dummy rounds are inert rounds. They look like real, real rounds, but they are very easy to tell that they are not because they'll rattle. Ms. Gutierrez then went back to the church, showed the revolver to the first assistant director very fast. They only checked about three rounds, very quick. And they missed one round you will learn that one of the rounds in that revolver was a real round. And the evidence will show that Ms. Gutierrez then handed the gun to the defendant. And what you will learn is that once again, the defendant failed to do a gun check or a safety check with this armor. So he takes the firearm, puts it in his holster. Then Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza were doing this blocking. And the evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that the defendant 
again, did his own thing. You will hear from an individual by the name of Kent Jorgensen. Mr. Jorgensen will tell you that he's been involved in drafting and revising movie set safety rules. You will learn that these movie set safety rules require actors like the defendant to treat every firearm as though it's loaded, to never point a firearm at another person, and to never put your finger on the trigger unless you're prepared to shoot or to destroy whatever's in front of you. The evidence will show that on October 21st, 2021, after that lunch break, the defendant once again violated those set safety rules. And during this- Okay, blocking, so if the, okay, and then look at the attorney. The attorney is already like almost ready to talk. <laughs> His mouth is open, <laughs> he's ready to talk. If that's the case, right, that's a whole a whole different ball game because if the actor, it's like, if this is a toy gun, right? You've seen toy guns. I mean, kids play with toy guns all the time. They press it, they, they point at people. That's what they have the toy gun for. Now, if the actor is expected to treat that gun as if it was loaded, if it's a real gun, then you got all kinds of other things. Because honestly, a real gun, you cannot put your finger on the trigger. You cannot point it at someone. You cannot go like this. I took a class before for concealed weapon. And the guy was like, listen, if you point this gun at me, like the, the person that was training me, he said, you're going to have to go, you know, get out. And sometimes people forget because they think, oh, just how do I do this? How do I, how do I reload this? And he's like, don't do that. Just uh, move your hands away. Call me and I'll help you. So if he is expected to have those standards, that's a whole different ball game. And I don't think uh, his attorney is going to agree with her on that. Look, his eyes just, just open up like, take out that gun and just hold it at an angle. Like, I can't wait but to you destroy your argument. Takes it out quickly <laughs> the first time, points it. And you will hear witness testimony who will tell you the first time he does it, his finger is on or around the trigger. He does it again takes it out very fast, points it. And once again, you will hear testimony that his finger was on or around the trigger. And the evidence will show that that third and fatal time, he takes it out once again, fast, hammers cocks, cocks the hammer, points it straight at Ms. Hutchins and fires that gun. Sending that live bullet right into Ms. Hutchins' body. You will learn that this bullet was a 45 caliber round that entered Ms. Hutchins' body right underneath her right underarm. It perforated her right lung. It traveled through her spine, lacerating her spinal cord, and then it exited on the left side of her back. That bullet then went into Joel Souza's right shoulder and it came to rest in his back from where doctors removed it once he was transported to St. Vincent's Hospital here in San Francisco. You will learn, ladies and gentlemen, that Ms. Hutchins did not have the same fate. You will see the aftermath of the shooting, and you will see medics frantically working to save Ms. Hutchins, to stabilize her, to transport her, to airlift her to UNM Hospital. But the damage from that bullet was too much. Ms. Hutchins succumbed to her injuries and bled to death. The evidence will show that meanwhile, after the shooting, the defendant began to claim he didn't pull the trigger. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that's not possible. You will hear from Mr. Pieta himself who will tell you that gun will not discharge without a pull of the trigger. You will hear from firearms experts who will tell you that gun will not discharge without a pull of that trigger. The evidence will show that law enforcement officials arrived at the scene on October 21st after the shooting and immediately took this gun into their custody. Then later they asked the FBI for assistance in processing this gun for forensics and examination. You will learn that the gun and some ammunition that was taken from the set and from PDQ arms were sent to the FBI for analysis. You will learn that the gun first went to the DNA section of the lab where a DNA analyst found the defendant's DNA on this gun 
And then the gun was transferred to the firearms and tool mark section of the lab, where a firearms examiner examined this gun very carefully and closely. Bryce Ziegler, who is the firearms examiner for the FBI, will tell you that when he received this firearm, he first examined it. He didn't see any defects, didn't see any modifications. He tried and he checked the hammer in the three different positions, cocking positions. He checked the quarter cock position, fine. Checked the half cock position, fine. Checked the full cock position, fine. And when he held it in the full cock position, you will hear that hammer held until he pulled the trigger. You will also hear that Mr. Ziegler test fired this gun 12 different times. And each time that gun fired as it was designed. Each time when he pulled that trigger, it fired. And he will tell you that not once did this gun malfunction or discharge on its own. Now the evidence will show that because the defendant had been claiming that he didn't pull the trigger, Mr. Ziegler suggested one last test to the Sheriff's Department. Mr. Ziegler told the Sheriff's Department that he could do what's called an accidental discharge test. He obtained authorization to do this test. And you will hear that he left that test for last because that test could potentially damage the gun. Mr. Ziegler went forward after he received this authorization and conducted the accidental discharge test. And you will hear, ladies and gentlemen, that during that test, a couple of the internal components of this firearm damaged. You will hear that the trigger sear and the full cock hammer notch were damaged during the accidental discharge testing. <coughs> the evidence will show, however, that before this accidental discharge testing by the FBI, this gun functioned and worked perfectly fine. You'll see the video footage of the multiple occasions during which the defendant used this firearm on the set, and each time he fired it, it was working just fine. And in fact, you'll hear evidence that the defendant himself admitted in December of 2021 that this gun didn't have any mechanical problems. You will hear from the two of the country's leading experts on firearms forensics, Michael Haig and Lucian Haig. And they will tell you that they examined the revolver and the damaged pieces extensively. They will tell you that the damage to the full cock trigger notch is consistent with the accidental discharge testing that was conducted by the FBI. Lucian Haig will tell you that in August of 2023, he examined the trigger sear, the other piece, and that when he looked at it initially with the naked eye, there was nothing wrong with it. He couldn't see anything. But then he put it under the microscope and he noticed some kind of rough microscopic diagonal lines on the surface of the trigger sear. And since at the time he did not know how Mr. Ziegler had conducted the accidental discharge test, he opined that these very small microscopic lines were likely not caused by the FBI accidental discharge testing, but he could not exclude that as the source of those lines. Then a few weeks ago, Mr. Haig will tell you that he spoke with Mr. Ziegler and he learned how Mr. Ziegler had conducted the accidental discharge test. Mr. Ziegler explained that he affixed that firearm onto a fixed platform and then struck the firearm on six different planes with a rubber mallet. And Mr. Ziegler explained to Mr. Haig that he had not affixed the mallet to another fixed device. Instead, he did it freehand. Mr. Haig will tell you with his 50 plus years of experience as a forensic firearms forensics expert, he opined or concluded that those very tiny microscopic diagonal lines on the surface of the trigger sear were likely caused by the FBI's accidental discharge test. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that regardless of how those tiny microscopic lines got on that trigger sear, these firearms experts will tell you that those would not affect the functionality of this firearm. At the end of this case, ladies and gentlemen, you are going to conclude and be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that on October 21st, 2021, that gun the defendant had asked to be assigned worked perfectly fine as it was designed. And that the fatal and one of the main problems that afternoon of October 21st was that the defendant didn't do a gun safety check with that inexperienced armorer. He pointed the gun at another human being 
cocked the hammer and pulled that trigger in reckless disregard for Ms. Hutchins' safety. And you will be convinced that the only true and just verdict in this case, so that true justice can be served, is a verdict of guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spiro. And there we have it. There we have. Now he finally looks towards that way, right? The whole time he turns his entire body, uh, he turns his entire back to the prosecution, to the prosecutor. She's doing the opening statements. And now he finally is like, is she, is she done? Is she, is she done? Like, is she, did she disappear just now? Because I may turn my body a little bit and very stressful. You know, imagine you being in a situation where you are uh, in a criminal trial with some serious charges and somebody's just, you know, going at it, t telling these people how you did it, how you should be guilty. How, you know, I don't fault his body language at all. Uh, but let's see if it changes at all. And look, even his eyes, he is kind of like looking, you know, when we look, uh, we, we give that side look, like, is she gone? Is, is she done? And look how angry his wife still looks. He touches his nose, pacifying behavior, kind of like we're done with this moment. Let's get out and let's get to the defense, defense opening statements. Let's go with the big, big New York lawyers in New Mexico. Oh, what happened? Something didn't work already? <sighs> I really like the female attorney. I forget his her name. We're going to definitely learn more as we go. Uh, but let's get this party started. Can I proceed? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. This was an unspeakable tragedy. Absolutely, but sir. committed no crime. He was an actor acting, playing the role of Harlan Rust. An actor playing a character can act in ways that are lethal, that just aren't lethal on a movie set. These cardinal rules, they're not cardinal rules on a movie set. And I don't have to tell you much more about this because you've all seen gunfights in movies. And the reason that can happen is because safety is ensured before the actor. Okay. On this movie set, there were people responsible for ensuring the safety of the set and the firearm. Those people failed in their duties, but Alec Baldwin committed no crime. The most critical issue in this case is how a real bullet got on a movie set. The evidence will show that real bullets are never supposed to be on movie sets. Movie sets use dummies and blanks. Movie sets use dummies, fake inert bullets that look like real bullets. They don't go bang for when you want a close up of the gun. You can't tell them apart from live bullets by looking at them, which is why live bullets can be nowhere near a movie set. And if the director wants a shot of the gun going, you know, bang poof, there's blanks that they can use. And those blanks look nothing like real bullets. And they um, are used for those shooting scenes. And, you know, they'll play these videos that they described of Alex, you know, front firearm in the movie going bang, poof. You know, and people are conditioned to seeing people firing weapons and thinking that's a dangerous act. That's a dangerous act. And they will play those videos and give you that image to try to tarnish him in your eyes. But that's not what happened here. On this set, there was a real bullet, something that should never be on a movie set, something which has nothing to do with making a movie. And you will hear no evidence, not one word, that Alec Baldwin had anything to do with that real bullet being brought onto that set. The second critical issue in this case is why did a real bullet get loaded into a prop movie gun? It is undisputed that the bullet was loaded into the gun by the armorer, the person on set whose responsibility it was to ensure the gun was safe. And, and so picture that. Let moment. me just pause here for one second. And by the way, if you guys haven't watched the armor, Anna Gitti. Anna Gutierrez has been tried. We had a trial for her. The same prosecution, the same judge, different defense attorneys, of course. And she was convicted to the maximum sentence, which was 18 months. Hannah Gutierrez Reed was sentenced to 18 months for this specific incident. And this judge gave her the maximum sentence. Of the armor placing a live bullet into that firearm. You know, you hear the prosecutor say, you know, he did this or he performed in a certain way. He picked out the biggest gun as his prop. It's to tarnish him in your eyes. You will hear no evidence whatsoever. No evidence that anything Mr. Baldwin did, that something he did in that moment, that horrible moment when she put that bullet in that gun, 
None of it had anything to do with Alec Baldwin. And finally, the first assistant director's job, the head of safety, Dave Halls, checks it before it goes to the actor. And he will tell you he made a tragic mistake. He failed to detect a live bullet. And Alec Baldwin had nothing to do with that either. So all this evidence that the prosecutor just outlined, all of it, has nothing to do with these critical issues. Nothing. Which leads us to this. The evidence will show that... Let I'm me just set. pause here real quick. I have to make comments on his body language, right, guy? That Right, guys? That's what we're here for. So he's already completely different, right? His chest is up. His posture is up. He is more open, even though he is crossing his arms. You can see how his chest and his shoulders are open, meaning I am open to this information that you're giving me. I am accepting what you're giving me. His lips are pursing a little bit, usually a sign of disagreement with the situation in this case, because obviously it's his defense attorney. He's not disagreeing with the attorney, but he is like very interested in the opening statement, kind of like. Huh, interesting. Yeah, you keep talking, sir. You're, you sound very smart. You have great things to say. And you can just see the whole difference and the fact that he's facing the attorney, which is completely different from this, which we saw throughout the whole prosecution opening statement. <laughs> so let's keep going. Safety has to occur before the gun is placed in the actor's hands. In this case, this unique case on a movie set, the prop gun was placed in Mr. Baldwin's hands and cold gun was announced, meaning it had been checked and double checked by those responsible to ensure the gun was safe. It was just a prop. They all thought it was just a prop and could do no harm. The actor's job is to act, to rehearse, to choreograph his moves, to memorize his lines. He's Harlan Rust. He's an outlaw running for his life, who in the incident in question, he's pulling a six shooter to try to defend himself. That's why the gun has to be safe before it gets into the actor's hands. His mind is somewhere else, in the being of another, a century away, an outlaw. He must be able to take that weapon and use it as the person he's acting would. To wave it, to point it, to pull the trigger like actors do. In ways that would be lethal in the real world, but are not lethal on a movie set. And I'm going to show you that scene now before lunch. And if we could just play action. You're gonna go find some help. I don't need no damn help. You're gonna die for the He's wounded on the run. You can play again. Continue. All the rust. If you just stand up nice and slow, toss any weapons you have. He's on the church pew, bleeding, his hand gripping the revolver. He would defend himself against the men in the movie. Play. One more. You good? Ready? Set. Very good. Harlan Russ. Did you get up nice and slow, tossing weapons you have? Well, how close can I get right there? Joe, you're going to give you that line until he lands. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which way? Camera right or left? So camera left for now. I'll stand right here. So, so whip it out. Yeah. Okay, let me get this on the grease. Ready? Okay, ready? Okay, ready? Ready. And set. Ready. And action. Rush. Okay, so he, do it again. so he did touch the trigger there, I believe, right? Let's go a little bit backwards, 152. Let's see. Did you get up nice and slow, tossing weapons you have? Well, how close can I get right there? Joe, you want me to wait to give you that line until he lands? Until okay. camera lands? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, which way? Camera right or left? So camera left for now. I'll stand right here. So, so whip it out. Yeah. Okay, let me get this on the grease. Ready? Okay, ready? Okay, ready? Ready. And set. Ready. And action. Rush. Uh, 
Okay, see his finger is on the trigger, which if you are practicing gun safety for a real gun, that should not happen unless you are ready to shoot somebody. Otherwise, you have to keep your fingers out of the trigger. So here, obviously, he is showing his finger right there very clearly on the trigger. Uh, but he's an actor, right? And I'm not sure what's happening, what happened, what's going to happen. I'm going to watch the trial just like you guys from the beginning to the end and come up with our opinions as we go along. But in this, um, because for me, yes, his finger is on the trigger, but he's an actor. So he doesn't think this gun is possibly loaded. Like he doesn't even think this the possibility there's a live bullet in this set. He thinks it's a toy. That's what I would think. If it's a toy, I would be able to put it on, put my finger on the trigger. But we're going to hear from the specialists. We're going to hear from the people that actually know what the procedure are, procedures are for, this, uh, for actors in these scenarios. They want to do it again. There's no danger. They want to do it again. Arlen Rust. Again, the finger on the trigger, right? It's a scene similar to scenes we've all seen in movies and television. Again, let's take a pause to look at Carrie's face. She looks like she smelled a fart or she ate a lemon. Like, what does she look? Why does she look like that all the time? Like, let me try to, let me try. You try to copy her, like, what is it? It's like. What do you guys think? Do I, do I look like, do I look like Carrie? So that's her for me all the time. Anyways, uh, enough with my impressions of Carrie. Here we go performed by thousands of actors. And the scene that continues after lunch is the same scene, it's just not unfortunately captured on videotape. And the scene they envisioned and acted out, that prop gun was positioned in the afternoon so close to the camera that you could see inside, that you could feel it. Another thing that she just did right now, to me, very, very improper, right? She commented through, she was making a comment to her colleague during his opening statement, right? Kind of like, rah, 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 that's not possible. And that is completely inappropriate because the jury is right there listening. So uh, unbelievable, Carrie. Unbelievable. So Carrie was saying, no, it's not. During his opening statements. Can you guys believe that? She was saying, no, it's not. Let's go back a little bit and just see that again. And the scene they envisioned did act No, out, it's not. In crew in the scene. Absolutely improper from Carrie here. And the scene they envisioned did acted out, that prop gun was positioned in the afternoon so close to the camera that you could see inside that you could feel it you could feel that it was loaded and it was loaded of course with dummies dummies to make it look like a real gun but this one time one of those dummies was a real bullet the real bullet was not known to anyone in that church amongst the actors directors and crew in the scene everyone was doing exactly how they go about their business every day on a movie not as if some lethal element had been included in the environment you will see creativity and movement and everyone talking and vibrant no one had any idea that this venomous, toxic element had been inserted into this magic they were creating. But it did. It entered that place. It killed an amazing person. It wounded another, and it changed lives forever. And so to find out what happened on that movie set, you, knew, you need to do something that the prosecutors could never do. You have to step back and remember what they were doing on a movie set. What were Helena Hutchins, the cinematographer, Joel Souza, the director, and Alec Baldwin, the actor, doing on Bonanza Creek Ranch. You know, movies and magic have always been closely associated. The first people that made movies were magicians. And this imagination that happens in movies, you know, King Kong, he can stand above a city and Superman can fly, horses and snakes and gun battles. For this to all work, for cinematography, what Helena did to work, for acting to work, you have to be so close to the barrier of real and imagined that the viewer feels that they're there, that it's real. The viewer can't see strings from the stuntman. The stuntman must leap. The snake must hiss. And guns happen in movies. 
all over this country for many decades. Bang, bang. You've all seen it. Guns have been an element of theater and film and television since the earliest of times. Depictions of war and combat, Spartacus, it stirs audiences because it feels real. Later films, Platoon, Apocalypse Now, they showed the unvarnished realities of war. This ranch in Santa Fe, it had been the scene to many gunfights and movie scenes, well before Alec was even born. Laramie, Butch and the Sundance Kid, and these Westerns. Okay, I guess they weren't supposed to to give examples of movies. There were some pre-trial motions. So this is why they're approaching. All right. But we get the point. The evidence will show. Kind of sounded like an Oscar moment, right? Movies. This movie because and that movies movie. Because about people's lives and guns are in people's lives. So let's talk about the evidence and how the lethal bullet got there. How did this happen and how did it unfold? The evidence will be the following. Everybody on a movie set has a role. The armor or armors, the director directs, the actor acts. They work in harmony, but they have a division of responsibility. Safety being important has the first assistant director, whose name is Dave Halls, above the-, the And what the happened to Dave Halls? Why and isn't on he on question, trial? The cast and the creative directors and crew in the church, it's a, it's a fake church. Their actors are not in their normal clothes, it's costumes. There's debris falling from the ceiling, it's fake debris. And they yell out cold gun. And that is an important term you're gonna learn in this case. It means that the gun is cold. No one need worry. But even that requires a little bit more explanation. Cold gun doesn't mean no live bullets. There are for sure 100% no live bullets on movie sets. That's unimaginable. Cold means you don't even have the fake, fake blank poof um, dump, uh, in it. You don't need to worry even about you know, eye gear or, 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 or um, earplugs for, for that fake bang. It means it's empty, inert, cosmetic, can do no harm. Cold guns can't hurt people. It's impossible literally impossible for a cold gun to hurt somebody. You, you, you could hurt you more by dropping it on your foot. And that's why these artists are carrying on in their art. Cold gun, gun, all clear to go. And the armorer on the set hands a prop gun to Alec, like she had done times before, like people have done with him in movies for a generation. And he's there, he's in the movie set church with his movie set gear and his holster, and he takes his movie set gun. And he's deeply focused in that moment on his character. The artists, the crew members, they're, they're moving around him. Again, no, no eye, eye gear or earplugs, nothing to protect against. They carry on. So here we just got a little bit of a lip, pursing lip, disappearing lips. Just a sign of, you know, anxiety, completely normal. His wife, though, still looks very angry, right? I prefer, I prefer uh, anxiety and worry and concern over anger as far as the position they're in. Right, because anger could could seem a little bit more like, I can't believe I'm here. I'm above all this. You know, this is a ridiculous situation. Whereas his face is more appropriate right now for the position he's in. He's showing stress and concern and reverence, seriousness about the position and about what happened, especially to the victim, who is the most important person. Um, you know, because of her, we're here trying to find justice, trying to find out what happened. But it is not very fair in my opinion because the guy who was, uh, this guy, Dave, Dave Halls, I believe, the guy who was responsible for safety, he got a deal right in the beginning and he just signed a deal, I think probation or something, nothing huge. And then you got the actor on trial and you got you know the, the girl, Hannah Gutierrez, who wasn't experienced or anything. So... It's a little unfair how the justice system works sometimes because the prosecution goes all hard on someone like Alec Baldwin, who's an actor, and he's not even supposed to have a hot gun. But the guy that actually is responsible for safety doesn't get prosecuted with a criminal charge like this. So that part, you know, that's besides the point. We're not here for that. But um, anyway, they practice, they rehearse, they take a lunch break. Some folks leave, some don't. They continue the scene. Dave Halls, the head of safety, is actually practicing the movement so they can frame, they can frame the, the footage that will happen after lunch. And the prop cold gun comes back. The prop cold gun comes back, cold gun. They call it again, same gun, again, safe. The first assistant director, Dave Halls, head of safety for the entire film, a man with decades of experience, comes and takes the additional step and inspects the gun, verifies again, cold gun. Everyone relax, go back to focus on the making of a movie. There's nothing in the gun that can hurt anybody. And Alex sits on that pier. 
And they, the creative directors, the crew, they're moving around him in front of him. And Harlan Rust, he begins, like the prosecutor told you, rehearsing, acting. This is a completely mundane, uneventful routine act on a movie set, on a movie set. And so everybody carries on. Nobody fathomed, imagined, foresaw any possible danger. They moved around Alec as he practiced his draw. As the prosecutor put it, working out the details of the move in the actor. He does it, does it again, does it in a different way. Nobody bats an eye. And they will tell you that the investigation revealed that Baldwin was practicing drawing and pointing the weapon of the scene with guidance and instruction from Helena Hutchins and Joel Souza. The gun goes off. Everybody's shocked. Alec is startled. He, 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 he immediately says, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't mean to shoot the gun. I didn't pull the trigger. Immediately. What the hell just happened? They collectively explain. Shock turns to panic. 911 is called. Two people accidentally with one gun. Gunshots as on movie set, Bonanza Creek Ranch. Send it, send it. I'll connect you with medical dispatch. Don't you? Sanity Fire and EMS on the location of emergency? No, uh, Bonanza Creek Ranch has two people accidentally shot on a movie set by a prop gun. We need help immediately. Okay. It is fucking IG that yelled at me at lunch because asking about revisions. This motherfucker, did you see him? We all went to jail. What? Oh my goodness. I was sitting, we were rehearsing, and it went off, and I ran out. Who was responsible? On a movie set with a prop gun. The fucking AD. It was his responsibility. AD. Not a word about Alec Baldwin. While they're en route, police EMS, the cast and crew are outside trying to figure out what happened. Frantic. Talking to those responsible. This girl, the blonde safety. girl. The armorer is yelling. She's Sorry. looking at the jury. Paul's the first assistant director. She's like, what's going on with their the faces? The master, Sarah Zachary. I, I don't know exactly where she is at, at that point. But they check the gun furbishly. They take the ammo out of the gun. They look at it. What the heck happened? They go back to the prop cart that houses the ammo. They're touching the gun and manipulating the gun, emptying it. They go and move some stuff off the prop cart, trying to figure it out. Sarah Zachary, the head of props, will tell you she threw some stuff out. And, and eventually, of course, EMS and police arrive pretty soon thereafter. And Helena Hutchins and Joel Souza, the director, are transported to the hospital where Helena tragically passes away. And, and I'm not going to be asking questions about her condition after she was wounded or the medical interventions that followed. Her injuries, the efforts to revive her are not in dispute in this case. Um, the evidence will, will be there. The prosecutor may present some of these emotionally charged images, um, but we're not going to be asking questions about that. And it's not an issue of dispute in this case. Um, and and uh, you jurors are allowed to ask yourselves whether or not that should be the focus or the focus should be the evidence. So police enter the scene. They have lapel cameras. Thank God they have lapel cameras. You want to see what happens? The evidence will show you can play the videotape. Want to see if they take the right gun? Play the videotape. Want to make sure what the people said or did they're remembering correctly? Play the videotape. And so they immediately recover the prop gun and they secure it. That's off to the side. And, and the reason that you preserve things in the moment is so that you know what existed in the moment, the evidence in the moment, the people and the witnesses and what they said in the moment. These folks, the members of Rust, They'd never been through anything like this before. That is why what they originally said matters so much in this case. If you remember anything I say today as the evidence proceeds, remember that. Look at the evidence of what the people of Rust said and did that day. Life changes, memories change. There are human motivations, internal pressure, external pressure. That's why preservation is so important. So the police continue. In terms of the prop cart and the prop ammo that's on the cart, it's manipulated, altered, kind of messy. Um, and, you know, at this accidental shooting on a movie set, the police begin to make some mistakes. No one had ever investigated a prop gun on a movie set before. They recover the prop gun, but they don't wear gloves. They don't have the prop car inside the crime scene. Someone moves it onto the crime scene. People start touching it and showing, okay, this is a dummy. This is a blank. And then they make another mistake that, that matters in this case um, um, with some more significance, which is that they don't secure the prop truck that houses the car. See, that cart that they roll off comes from a truck where all of the ammunition all of the firearms are, and that's where they're stored. They don't secure the prop truck for several days. Um, and then the prop house that supplies the truck, that supplies the cart, they don't secure for over a month. A lot of mistakes. They had never investigated a case in a movie set. But they had the prop gun. That was key. Um, and so they needed to figure out where the live bullet came from. They had the shell casing, Starline brass. That's the, that's the sort of make. You'll hear that phrase, Starline brass. 
And the police were right to focus on that. That was the lethal element. And so they work outward. Makes good enough sense. Folks around the ammo and the gun to be interviewed at the precinct. The armorer at the precinct. She loaded the live bullet. Halls, head of safety. He double checked. And Alec walks up to the police. You'll see this early today. And he says, I'm here. Whatever you want to do. Whatever you need me to do. Just tell me where to go. And uh, Sarah Zachary, prop master who threw out the stuff at the cart, they, they missed her that night um, to bring to the precinct. But the rest of them at the precinct. And thankfully, we have the lapel cameras. And then we cleared, they cleared the gun outside after that his request. And I witnessed them clear it. And so it was. Okay. So, so the one was, yes. the one that was missing, the, the one that fired, we don't know. But all the other ones were I can turn, I can pause this. I can turn this off. Move on. That was just a, a quick snapshot of the scene. Let, let, let's approach her. This, this is this, Ms. Johnson. This is what, Carrie? Uh, let's approach her. Uh, 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 this is this is. Uh, she's just so irritating. I can't. I can't with her. I mean, we did have Lolly. We had Lolly. We had Lolly. So we have to count our blessings. And now we have Carrie. But I don't know. I don't know. What, if anything, do you prefer? Uh, uh, oh, Your Honor, this is this is ridiculous, Your Honor. This guy doesn't know what to do, what he's doing. This New York attorney is trying to do objections with a basis. He's trying to say objection relevance. What is this? No, we're supposed to talk here, Your Honor, whatever we want. We just want to say the things we want to say, Your Honor. So that's Carrie for you. That means that she's coming up next, right? Uh, wait, she is objecting his opening statement, meaning, and she wasn't the one doing the opening statement herself? The remaining witnesses from inside huh. the church are Weird. interviewed on the I scene. thought the other attorney was supposed to object because she was the one doing the opening statement. They're interviewed by the lead detective. Let's detective keep going. Thing. And those witnesses, some of them will come in here and testify. And not a single one of them will tell you anything different than what I'm about See, to tell that, you. About that the okay, so that face right there from the wife, <laughs> I think is a bit it's a bit weird. But you know, she can't help it. She's 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 a famous you know actor's wife. But she's like mm, with her big diamond ring on her finger, and I don't know how the jury looks at that, honestly, you know, but I do like Alex's uh, disposition so far. He's just showing, you know, reverence, reverence, respect. The gun was double checked, verified it was a cold gun, not an actor's responsibility to check. Safety was ensured before. Alec was doing his practicing, his rehearsing, his movements. People manipulate and point guns on movie sets. The gun went off during the rehearsal. No one saw him intentionally pull the trigger. It was obviously a tragic accident. But Alec committed no homicide. Alec took the gun from those charged with its safety. He did not tamper with it. He did not load it himself. He did not leave it unattended. It completed his costume and his character. It was an actor handling a prop and integrating it into the character of Harlan Rust. There was yeah. a dedicated professional there, off camera, whose sole sacred responsibility was that prop safety. And Dave Halls, the head of safety, was there by her side. Everyone relied on that. And it was tragic that they let them down. He was just acting as he has done for generations, and it was the safety apparatus that failed them all. So law enforcement continues. They need to find the live bullet. That was the lethal element. So they, led by Detective Cano, execute a search warrant on the church. And that's what law enforcement does. They immediately go to a judge. They say, this is what we need to do. They go into the church urgently before anything can be altered. They're confirming it was an accident, not a crime in the church. They search for guns and ammunition, videos and photos. There was no further answer in the church. They had the prop gun. They had all those witnesses secured. Their statements are clear. Alec had committed no crime, but the bullet was a mystery. And so they focus on the bullet, the critical lethal bullet, and how did it enter the movie set? So they had the prop cart, and then they go do the warrant on the prop truck. And so at that point, and I'm going to put up a photo so that you can see some of these individuals are, um, they're trying to figure out when they go to the truck, where is what is the source of the lethal, lethal bullet? And so they execute a warrant on the truck approximately a week later. The Seth Kenny that you heard about in the prosecutor's opening, the supplier for the set, he's there. Sarah Zachary, the prop master, she's there. And they walk through what's inside of the prop. I track. like that they did this, a visual already, no much easier than anything we saw at the Carrie Reed trial that was so complicated, right? They talked, they talked, they talked, just showed, just showed the, a picture of the house after 
many witnesses. So this is very, very, very simple to see. We got Dave Hall's head of safety. He's the one that got a good deal and got out of this. We got Seth Kenny, supplier. We got Sarah Zachary. We got Hannah Gutierrez Reed, who was convicted of 18 months. So very uh, useful, very good visual for us to point, you know, to make already in our minds who is who and remember that. Be the bull. And, you know, the, 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 this case then takes on, you know, uh, uh, all this pressure, you know, the media begins swirling. Where is the lethal bullet? How did it got, get on that movie set? And what about that actor, Alec Baldwin, who had nothing to do with why the bullet got on the movie set? And so police and prosecutors, they work hand in hand, meeting after meeting, trying to find the lethal bullet, meeting with Seth Kenny, meeting with Sarah Zachary, the prop master, the supplier. Where is it? And about a month after the incident, Sarah Zachary finally sits down with law enforcement to answer some questions. And um, she explains to them that she, she threw away some stuff. She, she disposed of some stuff. Um, and they, the prosecutors and police keep meeting, swirling media. And then at that point, they go to the last step, right? Done the cart, gone to the truck, met with Sarah Zachary, and they go execute a search warrant on, as the prosecutor told you, PDQ, the prop house. And again, Seth Kenny's there to greet them, let them in, and they don't find the lethal bullet. They never did. They never did. And as things roll into police and prosecutors, cell phones and photos and forensics, looking for this shiny object, they found another shiny object. Instead of trying to find the source of the lethal bullet, they focus on Mr. Baldwin. But Mr. Baldwin was like every other actor. He goes bang, bang in movies. He's told when guns are cold or not. He rehearses and acts as his character. Safety proceeds before the actor. Once the actor has the prop gun, he can handle it however a person he's acting as would. A properly cleared gun can't hurt anybody. And so they told you about some of the things that Alex said in the statements that they will they will take or, or pick out a few lines from. But he won't tell you anything different, that he, that he took a gun loaded and cleared by the armor in the A-Day. He made motions with the gun as he was rehearsing. He didn't intentionally pull the trigger. The gun just went off. And he does say, I didn't have a problem with the gun before. And this idea, you know, that they said that, that he, would, he didn't want to check because he would offend them. You know, in this moment, he, he's been doing this for 40 years, the evidence will show. And he has habits. And there are also SAG guidelines that tell actors what to do and what not to do. And the SAG guidelines don't tell actors to check the gun. You will see them. That's not the actor's role. And so I guess the point that they're trying to make is that why in this specific moment, he doesn't break his habit of 40 years and, and check it differently and sort of insult them this one time. You know, if he had done that and started playing with the gun in that way, they'd be saying, arrogant actor, why is he doing that? So they will play these statements, Alex's statements. You're going to hear a man in shock and grief, a father, an artist, worried about his family. You hear he's, you know, on one of the calls, he's, he's going to meet with the decedent's family, the Hutchins family, and he's upset about that. He will talk to law enforcement. He will call them. He doesn't need a lawyer. He didn't commit a crime. He will call them and offer to meet and speak over and over again. And ask anyone in the acting world. Actors know. Actors rely on armors and point guns and shoot guns. The Armorers Act, what they did, is clear and proven. The head of safety, you will learn, took responsibility for his verification failure. But Alec committed no homicide. So law enforcement didn't have a homicide case against Alec Baldwin. But they changed the question. You heard the prosecutor tell you about this. Did he pull the trigger? Did he pull the trigger? Did he intentionally pull the trigger? And if, if he did, of course... That would only make his statement incorrect, right? That would mean he would have misspoke and incorrect, you know, and I want to stop for a moment and just tell you, because you're going to hear a lot of testimony, expert testimony that the prosecutor told you about the gun functioning imperfectly. Did he let the hammer down when he cocked it? Did he hit the trigger? Did he in a calculated manner as the prosecutor met, um, made a motion, you know, fire the gun like that? And when this issue is discussed, it's easy to sort of pull yourself into courtroom land and away from a movie set. On a movie set, you're allowed to pull the trigger. So even if, even if he intentionally pulled the trigger like the prosecutor just demonstrated, that doesn't make him guilty of homicide. He did not know or have any reason to know that gun was loaded with a live bullet. That's the key. That live bullet is the key. That is. I believe this is the third time that he uses the word homicide. And words are very important, right? The charge here is negligent. What is the charge? The charge here is involuntary men's slaughter. Now look at how the charge sounds. Involuntary. He didn't mean to do it. Men's slaughter, right? He's using the word homicide, homicide, homicide. He did not murder her because we do 
equates homicide murder with something intentional. He's not being charged for anything intentional here, but the attorney is using those words to put in the jury's mind that this is a serious crime that he's being accused of and that he could not possibly be found guilty because you know he's an actor. You know him. You've seen his movies for years and years and years. How could he murder somebody? It was an accident. So he is doing a very good job at playing with words and, you know, inserting in the, it's the opposite of when we do a softener. A softener is when we do something wrong. Uh, let's say, for example, somebody did commit a murder, right? And instead of saying, yes, I killed her, they say, yes, uh, it was horrible what happened to her. It's a softener. I'm going to make this sound a little bit better than what it is. So what he's doing is the opposite of that. He's making it sound worse than it is so that the jury can put a block in their minds and be like, no, he didn't murder anybody. He didn't commit homicide, right? But that's not the charge. So let's keep going. We're almost done with his opening. Statement. But again, as the prosecutor told you, they, if they could prove that he intentionally pulled the trigger and he was imperfect, imprecise, wrong with what he said, then maybe you take that you say he's lying. And if he's a liar, he committed homicide. And so what they do is they take the prop gun. They're blinded by the shot. They're blinded by trying to disprove Alec. They take it and they order a destructive test on the firearm. They order the FBI to take a test that they know will destroy the firearm. It's a pointless, unnecessary test where they blindly try to make this big case by taking a mallet and smashing the firearm. At the time that they did that, they knew that Alec had, had maintained, adamantly maintained, that he was manipulating the hammer and the gun just went off. That the witnesses said it went off out of nowhere. That there are these accidental discharges that happen on the set. That guns have issues in the real world. That this gun had a hair trigger. And the owner's manual of this specific gun actually says that if you load it with a live round or any round in the chamber, in, in that last position, and you drop it like you see a cowboy in a movie, this type of old cowboy gun can accidentally go off. I don't remember hearing anything about that. The evidence will show that. So rather than trying to answer the question of what happened, they proceed with the destructive test. They eliminate the one item, <clears throat> the one item that could prove what Alex said and believed. They didn't offer him a chance to test the gun. They didn't take the gun apart before they broke it and destroyed it and look at its inner workings. They didn't turn on their videotape. It just destroyed it. Can't ever be tested in the same condition it was in that day. Won't ever allow Alex to show his truth. And the destruction of this gun that you will hear in this evidence is symbolic of this entire case because the officers will tell you at that point they weren't really investigating anymore they were trying to disprove alec to get alec to have this day and so after the destruction of the firearm they hired some expert witnesses you heard about to, to pick up the pieces so to speak and the state retained lucian hay an expert with over half a century of experience and he will come into court and he will tell you he's never seen anything like this in his entire career they conducted a pointless test, a test that would lead to inevitable destruction of the firearm. There were other correct tests that they could have done to prove whether or not it could have accidentally discharged. None of the experts can test the gun in the condition it was in on the day in question. Why? Not because of something that Alec Baldwin or the crew members of Russ did. They were all clear. The gun just went off. But because of something that law enforcement did, and they deprived him of that opportunity. However, Lucian Haig will tell you that in his analysis, he did find modification that he thought likely pre-existed the FBI testing. And what that modification means and, and how it impacted the gun is hard to perfectly know, of course, but it, it was a modification on an important part, the critical part of the firearm. And it was important enough for them to put into a report and to write a new opinion about. They felt this revelation had to be sent to prosecutors. Okay, now Alec looks extremely angry here, okay? Uh, which it all makes sense, right? We always, when we do these videos on body language, we like to know about the subject. What are they talking about? What is the phrase? What is the sentence? What is the subject that is causing a facial reaction, a micro expression, something happening with the person's face? And in this case, he's talking about the destruction of the gun, the fact that Alec didn't have any recourse afterwards because they destroyed the weapon during their investigation. So he couldn't really do anything if he wanted to. If his defense wanted to do anything with the gun, he couldn't do anything. So then he is absolutely showing here the nostril is open, is flaring, okay? 
his wife is kind of like touching her chest as a protection uh, body language. Um, what do you say? A, a gesture, body language gesture of protection, of closing her her chest, which is, uh, you know, we, we uh, any animal has the abdomen as one of the most uh, fragile parts. And then we have this whole chest area as a very fragile part is where our hearts are. So she is closing that area as well. Meanwhile, Alec is looking angry at this specific moment. And it's interesting to see because when we see one expression from him and then all of a sudden we look and that's the expression, it's very visible. The anger is very visible. If we just continue to look at the screen the whole time, sometimes it's not visible. But if you're looking at him doing something else, like I was looking at him on another picture and then I looked at this and I'm like, oh, wow. Like you can see the nose opening up you can see the chin forward, right? It's like, let's go. A chin forward and you can see his face that he's angry and probably angry at the situation because they destroyed the weapon. So they, the defense has no recourse when it comes to that. And they maintained that position that this modification was a matter of import for almost a year. And then a few weeks ago before trial, they just took it back. They just took it back. You will get to see the circumstances of that take back. How far they would go for the shiny object. They never solved the question of the lethal bullet. All right, stop calling him a shiny all object. All they were left with is Alec Baldwin and the movie they intend to put on. But because they never solved the lethal bullet, they eliminated the prop gun. There will not be one witness, not one shred of evidence in this trial that Alec knew or should have known the gun was loaded with a live round. So they can't prove. They can't prove their high profile homicide case. So they, they will proceed to then here and now tell you about other things, other evidence that you will hear that has nothing to do with what happened in the church on October 21st, that the movie said as, as a whole was improper or anything, that he that they hired the wrong armor, I think I heard in, in opening. The, the, the evidence will show that the armor was hired by somebody else, trained by somebody else, had done gun scenes on Rust with somebody else before Alec even got there. She was a daughter and the apprentice of the most famous and well-respected armor in Hollywood. And she had just loved, left serving being an armorer for Nicolas Cage on another Western. Really? And they'll come in and they'll say, but what about the movie guidelines? Oh, about Mr. crap. And the movie guidelines. I but didn't the, know that. The protocols wasn't followed. Or there was a set safety issue about, about something unrelated to this. Like these movie guidelines on, on, on a set or the things of Navy SEALs and NASA. What? The guidelines were followed. They followed the safety guidelines. Actors don't check the weapons. Safety is ensured by dedicated personnel. So they will say, you know, but there had been accidental discharges on the set that guns had fired accidentally. Right. What's up with that? Alec, by the way. You know, but again, that's the people we looked at. Hannah Gutierrez Reed's fault. Sarah Zachary's fault, perhaps. Yeah, but wait, fault. wait, 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 sir. Sir, let's go back to common sense for a minute. Okay, let's just pretend we have a little bit of common sense for a minute. If there were accidental discharges in this set during the filming of this movie, with what? With real bullets? And what? And then you're still thinking that he shouldn't check? I don't know. What's up with these accidental shootings? Were they real bullets, bullets too? Issues. They were blank. Some of them will end up, and you will hear the witnesses in this case. Many of them have brought civil lawsuits. You know, and you'll hear that, you know, in those civil lawsuits, they're presenting evidence to try to meet a burden, not a, not a criminal beyond a reasonable doubt homicide trial burden, but they're going to try to prove their cases in civil courts. And that's where faults and accidents are at worst, 99% worked out, not here. But you'll hear these members of the Russ crew come in here. They'll try to make sense of this for you. Some of them have sued. Some of them are in grief. Some of them are in grief and have sued. And part of this <laughs> sure. grief they feel that everybody feels is understandable. And what they will do is they will tell you, you know, if, if only we had had a second armor, one of them will say, if only Dave Halls had checked better. If only the camera hadn't been right there and Ms. Hutchins wasn't leaning over the camera. If only I myself did this. If only Alec did that. This is natural, their testimony. It's part of the human condition. It's part of grief. None of them knew. Objection. Let's just ignore the objection. Are you going to approach or what? Because I told you you have to approach every single objection, you bastards. Because apparently you guys are kids and don't know how to object properly. So 
Yeah, it's part of human condition to try to find an answer. It's part of human nature to try to find an answer. That's, I don't see any problem with that. The witnesses As I in was the grief saying, will look for reasons oh, he to try won to make that. sense of this tragedy. But again, none of them knew or should have known about the lethal bullet either. No one had any idea that it was on that set or in that gun. In that world, they were all in it together. And you will hear that none of this other stuff has anything to do with those two critical questions we started with. Lots of anger why here from of everybody. Why the armor replaced it in the gun. And of course, why the head of safety failed to detect it. None of it speaks to whether Alec knew or should have known those things. He didn't. No one on that set did. It was not foreseeable. You will That's hear that important. from the witnesses and from the and from Not foreseeable. The and look at Alec. Let me write that down. This That's important. Anything other than foreseeable. And they must prove beyond any and all reasonable doubt that this was foreseeable. Oh. Total indifference to human life that death might occur. He's an actor. That's crazy. Okay. That's crazy, right? Because if he's an actor, how is he going to think that this is foreseeable, that this is possible, that he has total disregard for human life? So I like this. I like the closing of his opening statement. He's an actor. But here we are at a homicide trial. And so they will pull and they will pull witnesses and, and witnesses will be cross-examined. They will push themselves to the edge of truth and beyond. <laughs> you know, these things about, you know, Alec didn't notice this or Alec didn't notice that. I want to make sure that you're clear on something that the evidence will show. He had been filming on that set for a handful of days. The evidence will show he had just gotten there. It's not as if he had been there for months and months and noticed things and failed things. And he had just gotten there. Soft on your you face, Alex. You start Alec. Place when you're in the character. Of Soft on your face. But they will push forward and they will have gaps in the evidence as well. Don't expect you to be hearing and for them to call the first AD head of safety. I don't know if you'll be hearing from the lead detective, Kana, who investigated this case. The lead detective. Is it worse than Proctor? Sergeant Sook. Is it worse than Michael Proctor? Schiller, who was the lead investigator for the prosecutors. And so as you hear this, the ju you jurors can, can assess about that gap of evidence. And there's one thing that I can tell you you will not hear also. You will not hear from an actor or an expert in acting. And so they will play the videotapes of Alec Baldwin, the actor, acting. They will show you perhaps over and over again. Him in shooting scenes. Bad Alec. Bad Alec shooting a gun the wrong way in a movie scene. They will try to get you to picture that and forget that this was a movie set in the first place. And you will see actors in a Western acting. And your mind might go to your favorite gun scene in your favorite movie. You may picture actors and actresses doing exactly what you see here. The other actors in Rust are doing the same thing that Mr. Baldwin was doing. But when you come back from that moment, remember, this is a homicide trial. And you will see, you will see soon that the reason they play those videos of him over and over is because they don't have any ev evidence of actual homicide. And you will learn the truth. Not a day goes by when we don't wish Alec had saved your life. But never, the witnesses will tell you, in the history is something that an actor has done. Intercepted a live bullet from a prop gun. No actor in, in history. No one could have imagined or expected an actor to do that. So just remember that truth. So when they cry out justice, justice is truth. This was an unspeakable tragedy. Alec Baldwin committed no crime. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right so we're going to do great now is job. Take our um, morning um, bathroom break. Gonna, so please don't talk job. among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Um, and um, follow what Ms. Bing told you to do. And um, what, we'll see you back here about 20 up. All right. Thank you. All right, Your Honor. Great job in the opening statement for the defense. I'm always more, not always, I guess. But I do lean more towards defense usually because I think, you know, um, sending people to prison for, for a long time and we have such a high burden and like usually the investigations are shot and stuff. So I'm always a little bit, I lean more towards the defense. But I got to say, I lean more towards the defense so far. I think the facts may change for me a little bit when they start showing, you know, what kind of responsibilities the actor has, if he really had to treat it as a live gun, if he had to check the gun, if all of those may be his responsibilities, I might be, you know, I might change a little bit. But as of today, as of this opening statement, I'm kind of, I think she did a great job. The prosecutor did a great job. I prefer her a million times over Carrie. If I was her, I would not let Carrie speak. I'll be like, listen, Carrie, your face is saying things without you even saying anything. So please just disappear. I'll handle this. 
but he is at the end of the day he did say some things that didn't make sense to me like navy seal or whatever whatever but when he finished here he finished very strong he is an actor and it was not foreseeable if that's the burden that it was foreseeable how could it be foreseeable if it's foreseeable it means that he expected there to be a live gun if they're expected to be a live bullet and if he expected there to be a live bullet this is a real gun we're talking about like of course we're going to have different precautions we're not going to treat it like a toy so very interesting energy between the attorneys very interesting energy in court already you have all kinds of things going on with their body language and we are here for it so i hope you enjoyed this video and we're going to be watching this one closely and going through the witnesses as well i'll see you guys next time and i'm going to announce when we're going to go live next time to see everybody at once so have a great great day and i'll see you guys